and like I said, it wasn't it wasn't the first first video, the first ten videos that like did well. It was probably like closer to like twenty or so. And it's like, what would have happened if I didn't keep posting? Yeah. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Industry Set Podcast, where we interview high caliber artists and discuss all things music marketing, branding, networking, creating opportunities for yourself, production, productivity hacks and much, much more. And so if you are a music producer and you're looking to level up in all those areas, then be sure to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel below um, so you can you don't miss out on future episodes. And in today's episode, we're gonna be interviewing Neotech. And Neotech is actually one of my first students through industry set, um, well before it actually started out, um, back when I was running Defy Society. And so um, I helped Neotech rebrand his entire um, brand, which was previously called Keys, and we rebranded to uh, Neotech. And then he launched his project and within like a year, he already had bookings, management, um, playing shows around Australia, um, and now is signed to labels such as like Deadbeats. And in this episode, we go over a lot about productivity hacks, how he approaches his tracks, uh, workflow, sound design, how he got his sweater weather track uh, from being a bootleg into being a full on original with an actual label release after going semi viral on TikTok, how that whole process happened and a lot of other cool stuff. So let's get straight into it. I'm curious, like what, what got you into production originally, like going way back? Um, well, originally, like I started playing piano, um, like from school. Um, and like I had a piano teacher at the time. I think it was probably year eight or so, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, and that kind of led me into like, um, I guess like getting my first like DJ controller. It was like a small like uh, SB2. And then from there, um, I kind of like did more stuff on like the family desktop. I got like the, this like little launch key mini, um, you know, like you're like a free Ableton light version with that. So I would play around after school when I got that, um, for a few years, but I wasn't really too serious about it. And then I got like a few lessons from the piano teacher who knew a little bit about Ableton, um, and I kind of just like from there, it just really excited me. And then I, it kind of like took off. Um, but yeah, I guess that's how it started. Um, so originally you got into piano and then from there, that's kind of like, what was the like initial point really? Yeah, pretty much. Um, and like, cause I don't really have like a laptop or anything. I just, there was like a, desktop in like the um the study in our house um and so i can only have like eight channels and then for the first probably two years of ableton i didn't know about arrangement view i was just in session view and i was like cut all these loops and oh I yeah no, yeah i was I the same no actually I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know yeah, it's like I a whole doing. other world <laughs> literally i remember pressing it and i'm like wait what um yeah. but yeah there's still a few videos of me like just sitting there like after school and um i don't know it's pretty cool to look back on so that was probably like six or seven years ago um i think it was like 16 so yeah right i didn't realize you've been doing it for so long as well yeah i thought you only started like a couple of years ago yeah yeah so, so so what did your parents think of that like when you started like producing and, and like committing to it and whatnot um well it wasn't really like a thing until like i guess like after high school like i kind of it kind of became more and more of a thing the older I got and um I like I bought like Ableton standard and then from there I bought like Ableton suite so that, that was all like investments too um but then pretty much I was going to become like an electrician or something um but then I finished year 12 and then I kind of just want to give it like a full like crack, crack. so yeah. I, I I pretty much wasn't working at all I had like all this money saved up not like that much but like and i did like a live school course and i did like a mastering course too so i pretty much just spent everything i had on that right and then just did like 12 16 like 14 however many hour days just every day because i wanted to prove that like i could do it yeah so i did that for a year and i didn't really see like i didn't go out much it's kind of just I don't know. I just knew it had to, I had to drop everything to do so you that. Just went all in, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and 
and I was like getting like lessons of a bunch of like artists too. So I was pretty much just trying to take in as much. I had like, I probably got like three books worth of like notes and like mastering, like production, like yeah. marketing, like all that stuff. Cause like the day I, I knew I was like going to do it full time. Like I had all these different books for different things. And I've, I've still got them, but um, yeah. Then pretty much since then, like I haven't really, I guess stopped. Like it's, like, I guess I just wanted to prove that I could do it. And um, now I'm just working like part-time in a cafe to kind of fund my music. But obviously yeah. this is like the main focus. And, and so tell me a bit about that. Cause like, obviously you're, you're working part-time and then like, do you just go straight from that straight to like, just doing music as much as you can basically? Yeah, pretty much. So it's like, it used to be like two, like five hour shifts but now it's like four five hour shifts um so it's like it's not really that long it's not like that many hours but it's kind of good because sometimes the more time you have you can be a bit like complacent and then you're yeah. like if someone if you have like say like all day it's kind of hard to be like productive in that whole like 16 hours or whatever so it's i mean it's kind of good in a sense because you kind of just go a bit crazy and like burn out really quickly I found, um, but yeah, it's either my week is pretty much either we're going to work or working on music. So I feel like almost everything I do is like working towards the goal. Cause like the work money just like funds my like costs of like music. So like, I don't know, like artwork or whatever else. Yeah. Um, no, you made, you made an actually really good point there about, um, not, like let's say having like a like too much time available for music because hey guys hope you're enjoying this week's podcast if you haven't already please subscribe to our youtube channel below it helps out the channel it helps us reach more people and that way we can actually work with bigger and better artists for you guys to learn from and on top of that if you are a music producer who's looking to level up like your marketing your production your efficiency your speed so you can actually get these opportunities and get to where these guys are at then you can also check out the link in our description below. And from there, you can go to our website and put in your information. And from there, we can uh, see if you're a good fit for industry set in terms of how we help artists grow from where they're at to where they need to be in terms of becoming a touring artist and accelerating their production journey. Uh, that being said, I'll see you in the rest of the podcast. It, yeah, it definitely yeah. like is kind of intuitive because you almost feel like pressure to use that time to like write more, but then in doing that and having that pressure, it kind of pushes you away from wanting to do it. Cause you're like, Oh, I've got like, I should be yeah. using this time, but I can't because it's just like too much time to use. Um, so I totally relate that. Cause like when I started building music, like the reason why I built to fire and worked on forbidden society and doing industry set is because, so then I'd have the time to do music, but then often, oftentimes I would have too much time at my disposal yeah. and then I just wouldn't do anything at all. Cause it's like overwhelmed with how much free time you get, you know? Yeah. exactly. So yeah, totally understand that. So yeah, like to walk me through as well as uh, like your, your workflow approach, like for when you start a track, like, what do you, how do you, do you have like a system in place of like how you originally started or like is your template set up in a specific way? Um. Well, I have like a, yeah, a template. It was just like, like drums, basses, like intro stuff, which kind of, and then sometimes like a side chain set up, and then like my mask, so I just put like a clipper on and then all those things. And I have like an operator down the bottom just so I can have like everything kind of ready. Um, but in terms of starting, I mean, it depends. Like sometimes I'll start with a drop, sometimes I'll start with an intro. If I'm starting with a drop, usually I'll just like play around with some like sound design and then like kind of like find out a cool flow and then like put some drums over it. And then so like what I'd do is maybe I'd make like, I don't know, five to 10 of those. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, I want to finish this one. Um, and it's like, if it's like an intro, maybe I'll make like five of those. And then I have like all these like short whips. And then eventually I'll be like, oh, okay, this one's worth finishing. And then a lot of them are like, just stay there. And then like, it's good because then some of those ideas, like a lot of those ideas, I've just got like for collabs, like some of like, the collabs of having like someone hits you up they're like oh um love your stuff doing to work on something and then i've got like 30 40 tunes and then they just pick one and i send them the project and then you know what i mean and then 
they like i like a few things and it's like oh it's a new life to it and now i can look at it fresh and kind of come up with a new approach and that someone else wants to work in it maybe we'll be like a few times back and forth and it's like something completely different mm. um so but then sometimes like it just works it just works um from the get-go and it's just like a good idea but yeah it depends yeah i i i've actually followed that approach religiously as well um like batching content basically i mean the same with social media stuff like yeah like if you were to you know, hypothetically film like 10 videos in the same day and then you do all the editing and whatnot later on post. Um, but yeah, I, I follow the same kind of methodology um, actually in like my production and as well as what we do in industry set where we get people to do like just like a high volume of buildups into drops because that's like 90, well, not 90%, I'd say like 70% of the track basically like the in terms of structural points, like yeah. once you have the build up and the drop, you have like, the intensity, the energy, um, sure. the the flow is there. Um, and like any other ideas that come around that are just going to be based on that anyway. Um, that kind of same energy you put in down. Um, so that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally on board with that same kind of approach. So, so how many, like, just to reiterate what you're saying, how many tracks, like kind of ideas do you kind of do in like one session? Um, it depends. I like when you mentioned like going from like build to a job, I think something else important to mention is, um like i think it's like a year and a half ago or so i got like feedback about my intros that they weren't really like they were okay but they weren't really like groundbreaking and like my, right. my drops stood out more so pretty much what i did is a because i would almost always write drop whips first but then for like a few weeks i'm like what if i just write i don't know 20 intros and then if you i think a big thing is like your mindset towards your intros as well because like i used to like not really care about them but now i'm like it's just as important and yeah. like the whole progression of the track um is important but like i think it like really sets you apart when you can kind of do it all um so but... yeah totally I isolating specific parts of your production i think is like the best way yeah, you definitely. get better faster um something we do in like the industry set programs is actually getting somebody to um and i think i actually told you about it um a while back but basically I get somebody to do high volume recreating a reference, but a specific part of production. So like if I got someone to do five buildups and each buildup is recreating a reference track, they're not yeah. actually using their creative outset their outlet. They're using just purely the technical side. It's because like, if you're just copying something word for word, trying to get it as close as possible, you're not really using like creativity that yeah. much. You're also just trying to like get the technicality behind it. And so if somebody does that like five times from different references, I then can see like recurring problems. And so if let's say three out of the five of the buildups, they all have the same problem. That's like a bottleneck, right? So it's like, if somebody yeah. had like, you know, lack of mid base, it's like, well, that's your fucking problem, right? So I think recreating references is probably like the best thing for like leveling up, but also isolating specific things like you're saying, I think in conjunction together is like, you know, the best way possible. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I actually learned that from Jaquay in terms of like the referencing thing. Cause like, uh, yeah. me and him had a conversation about that. I think, I think you told me, uh, well, maybe I think he told me that you used to get lessons from him as well. Yeah. yeah. I got a few of him. Yeah. Yeah. Was, um, was it, was it more so like sound design related kind of stuff? Um, I think at the time where I got lessons from him, it was kind of like, I had like a bunch of tunes. I tried to get my, it was before I think I even launched Neotech. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe I had launched it, but. I remember it was around about the time and I was trying to get like the 10 tunes like for my brand to kind of like get ready and like send out to labels and artists and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think I can, I think to mention is it around that time, like I spent so long getting those like 10 songs ready and then like I started sending them out and like to labels and artists and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, everyone's going to care about me as soon as I start doing this. And like I put on my first song, it's like 500 streams and i'm like oh actually no one actually really cares yeah like you have to make them care like and it's like just being consistent and then since then like you just got to keep doing it but like it's kind of it's kind of funny you're like oh i spent all this time like surely it's going to pay off now and then but yeah um yeah definitely 
that can that consistency definitely pays off. I think um I actually show a lot of existing industry set students um your TikTok a lot just to like kind of encourage them to like push harder because a lot of them oh, yeah they get disheartened because they'll post like for like 10 days and they'll get like 100 views on each one and they go, Oh, well, I'm not viral yet. So this is, TikTok is bullshit. I'm yeah. I'm done. And like I just tell them like look at these examples of these different artists who have just been posting like very consecutively. And then that's when they finally get like the hundred K 300 K 500 K kind of players. Yeah. Um, so something else I want to talk about in terms of that is um, a little bit about how your like marketing growth was from uh sweater weather. Cause I think that's a good case study in the sense that yeah. you, you know, we're remixing it. You're pushing on TikTok. It went like semi-viral on TikTok and then turn into like an actual full on a release as well. So could you talk yeah. me through how that whole process happened? Like you remixing it and yeah, everything? Yeah, for sure. Well, originally I, I uploaded it as like a flip. Um, and then it was like, I don't know, probably had like 20K on SoundCloud or something. Um, and then I got asked by uh, Jordan. He was like, oh, this is sick. Like, let's make it a cover. So we got like the vocals resung and everything. And then we ended up putting it out on Spotify. Um and pretty much from there, like, I think I was, like, trying to do, like, one post a day, like, on TikTok. And I think mm -hmm. we did, like, I think it was two months. I kind of probably did about, like, 60 videos or something on that song, maybe maybe more. Um, and like I said, it wasn't it wasn't the first, first video, the first 10 videos that, like, did well. It was probably, like, closer to, like, 20 or so. And it's, like what would have happened if I didn't keep posting? Yeah. And then even like on TikTok, I see like people just like keep ram ramming their content. It's like, it's just, it's really is just consistency. And then it's, it's like hard the first time, but the more you do it, it you can literally whip out one in like a minute or two and you could do well. It's like, you understand it. Um, and another thing about TikTok is I've found like remixes work so much better than originals 100 like i think with that song like it was it's kind of like still relevant now but it, it's like old but like i don't know it's kind of just like the perfect storm really um so and then like that i think the biggest thing as well is like call to action something is people get a bit like scared about on tiktok is like kind of almost like maybe people look a little bit look a bit for the song because if it's like oh link in bio it just seems spammy um and i think a lot of things you have to be very smart about it and i think it's a good skill to have because when i was like doing it a lot i would have like content ideas and then like being like oh this is how you get more attention and this is how you do this and it, it kind of like you think about it more and it's it's really just important as like making good music and it's like it's it really it really is can like change your life like i've seen like so many artists just like blow up just because like they're good at like putting out content and like i don't know yeah yeah i i completely agree and it's something that i uh i keep telling people that they're putting their focus on the wrong things they're still going the orthodox approach of you know spending a lot of money on like soundcloud reposts and spotify yeah. placements like and all that kind of stuff and the, the problem with it is yeah you could still do that but with the 300 bucks that you just spent doing that you could have just posted a bunch of tiktok videos for free and probably gotten more if you yeah. just like stayed consistent to it but the problem is a lot of people they're too scared to like put their face out there and they just want to like oh, be reserved and and a lot of people are like oh tiktok it's like so cringe but it's like that's you don't like have to be cringe it's well, not it's yeah. not yeah you don't have to be cringe and and obviously like when you post like like a, a fully polished like out now video like i wouldn't even post that on there because i just know it's going to get like it doesn't matter yeah, how yeah. big you are it's going to get like no views like yeah it's just about i don't know obviously the hook um there's a retention there's a retention rate of getting somebody to watch the full thing from start to finish yeah um pattern interruptions hook um yeah something i've learned from um some other like bigger tiktokers because like I, i've even paid for like some coaching programs myself just to like learn more about like the algorithms and whatnot from like the bigger guys 
Yeah. And what I've learned is a lot of a lot of the big guys, they just use TikTok purely for testing. So they'll post like basically the same video multiple times, but just slightly different hook. So like the first two to three seconds are slightly different. And then they'll post like a, the exact same video like an hour later, but just slightly different just to see which one takes off. And then if if they both don't take off, they will post the same video again in like seven days or even weeks later, but they'll yeah. just like change it again slightly. And they'll just keep doing that until it actually becomes a winner. And if a video does become a winner where it gets like 50K, 100K, you know, upwards, they'll then post that winning one to Instagram or YouTube shorts. Yeah. And because the thing is with TikTok, it's just purely on retention rate. So it just really matters if somebody watches it from start to finish. It has nothing to do with your follower count because you could have zero followers and you could still have a million. But with Instagram and YouTube shorts, it's more based on average playtime plus, and then Instagram's also engagement rate. So if you get, you know, if you already have an existing audience on Instagram and you post the same video that you posted on TikTok on there, you're going to have way more views because you're, you're getting, you already know you've got a really good video and you've also got your existing engagement from your audience. So it like compounds. So that's what all the bigger guys do because they'll post one on TikTok and it'll get them like, you know, 500K, but then they'll post it on YouTube shorts that say, and they'll get like 5 million or they'll post it on Facebook reels and they get like 2 million or something. So, um, and also what you can do as well is if you've got any existing videos that have like good views, like for example, you've got a video that has like 500K that is, well, I think almost 500K is like 499 or something. Um, your sweater weather one where you're like, imagine if this is sweater weather was an EDM banger. That one got like 500k players, right? And you could literally post that exact same video without changing a single thing, and you might actually get like 200k or 300k, like literally, like yeah, you can actually post the exact same video again, um, like multiple times as long as it's after a seven day window. Um, if you try and post the exact same video like a day after, for example, it get bot, it gets like throttled. But if you post it seven days plus afterwards, you can actually like get basically the same views again. Um, and it might be just from, from completely different people this time as well. Because oftentimes what they'll do is they'll post a video that gets like 1 million and seven days later, they'll post it again. Like you you might see like, you know, for example, Andrew Tate shit is just like an everywhere because it's just regurgitated. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the best thing about it is that like, it doesn't matter. Like it's going to be a new person every time. So you can just, yeah. just keep posting it. No one's actually really going to care. Whereas yeah. Instagram is like a bit different. They're going to post the same video like 10 times. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, people worry too much about what they post on social, so they just don't post anything at all. Um, and that was yeah. something that I was guilty of for a long time too. I was like scared of showing my face whatsoever, so I just did stop posting completely. Um, and that's the biggest thing that like most people make the mistake on now is with the short form content. Like you have to be willing to put yourself out there and post as much as you can and not give a fuck about what people think about you. Oh, and it gets easier too. Like the first time I did the first video, I'm like, this is hard, but like, like if you do a few, it's easy. Like I used to be so scared of the camera, but yeah, it's just practice, I guess. Definitely. So, so what's your usual approach to sound design? Um, I have like a few different ways. I love like synthesize it with like operator. I'd like just get like a um, in it, and just start with a sign, and then I'll just like throw a bunch of processing on it. Um, and then I'll uh, resample that. Um into audio and then maybe mess up with some flows there or yeah. i would like grab um some samples and then do the same just kind of like process it uh but if i was doing like my more melodic stuff it's kind of like sweater weather I'd, I'd usually use like serum um and just like stack saws but i found like i found audio is really good because it's kind of sometimes when you have like a say like you make a patch and it's it's like got like a big bit of feedback or it's like um has like this big delay i think audio is cool because you can kind of reverse it like um make it longer like and you can kind of get like these cool flows and you know it's not going to change um so i don't know it just depends on like what i'm feeling but i've been using audio a lot a lot more lately mm. than than i have been because like I think another big thing is like when I was kind of starting out is I would think that you would have to make literally everything from scratch and I would just be like sitting there like trying to like make everything and like my intros it all just be like 
from a serum I made and it obviously sounded garbage, but I think being able to like utilize good samples, not just like, and knowing what a good sample is too. Like, I think like practicing picking drums is a big thing because a lot of people have, like you can hear like a song and it's like, say like a drum and bass song and it has like a dubstep kick. It's, it obviously doesn't sound good. Um, but I think the biggest thing with that is kind of just like time because that took me a long time to kind of, I guess, be like, oh, it's, it's this genre. It needs like a short snappy kick. Um, instead of like getting a sample and putting like a massive effects chain on it, it's way better just to pick a good sample and maybe put an EQ on it and call it a day. Um, yeah, so do, do you do much resampling with those samples as well? Um, yeah, it depends. Like sometimes I would just like um, have the, the sample I put in and just like use that straight away. Or sometimes I'll like resample it a few times. Um, and it's also cool sometimes if you have like a, if you make a patch, you just sit there and tweak the knobs for like, I don't know, maybe like a minute. And then if you do like tweak the norms really quickly and, and the whole time be resembling into audio and then say like there's, you have this one cool thing where it's like, I don't know, you, you tweak the filter um, and then you have that like as a fill. And then like, I've done it in a while, but I have like sound design sessions. And then I have like all these packs that I've made. It's like bases, glitches, effects. Um, and then, so I can have, that one minute clip and then maybe get like, I don't know, 15 samples out of it. And then next time I'm like making a track, I'm like, oh, here's a fill and I know it's unique and I made it. So, or like a growl or something like that, um, which I think is cool because it's like easy to access, but yeah. Yeah, so do, do you ever do like specific resampling sessions separate to like when you do make tracks? Yeah, I do, but I haven't done it in a while. Um, I need to do some more, but recently I've kind of just been kind of doing it all in the one the one session. But I think it definitely is a good idea to have resampling sessions so then you can use the bits you've got from that in like another track. And then you can have like your samples too. Like with my, when you have like the favorites tab with um, in Ableton, I've got like all my favorite drums, like my favorite, effects like all these different things so when i'm like starting a track i'm just like yep there's a good drums they're good snares like the kicks snares etc um rather than like going through like thousands of kicks and then trying to find the right one when i'm like i've got an idea in my head um but yeah yeah do you have any other kind of workflow tips like that for like being a little bit more efficient with your time um i think like learning shortcuts is good like I think the more you go, you like learn more shortcuts, like for example, like creating space, like command die. And then obviously like, I think that's going to make things quicker in Ableton. I have like a hotkey set up for like my mono. So I'll just press like the question mark and I'll go to mono straight away. So like I have like a few things routed in my template. So I don't have to set up every time, um, like side chain, the hotkey for mono, um, and even like a serum and an operator too. Also, like sometimes when you load a track in Ableton, you can have like a certain effect on it every time you load an audio track, for example. Like all my MIDI tracks, it's automatically a serum and all my audio tracks is an EQ. So instead of like grabbing an EQ or a serum every time, it's just it's just there. Um, but I think if you're constantly doing something, say if you're constantly like making your own sub or constantly making this effect chain just save it and put it somewhere where you know is good and then you can just like drop it on rather than wasting time yeah i i completely agree about that and with your template for example do you how much do you have in it uh because i know some people are more about you know if you have too much in it it kind of limits your creativity because yeah. you're you know stuck in a certain way oh it's about like 20 channels so it's like it's like a few empty channels on each group. Um, but I used to have like 60, but 
I agree. I think it just got too messy. I'd rather just keep it simple. Um, because a lot of the time I'll just start outside the group because I don't want to just do things quickly and I'll put it in later. Because, like, when you start an idea, you don't want to just be like, I don't know, tweaking around with groups and stuff. You kind of just want to get everything down and then you can clean it up later. Um, I, I've become really big on the function of Ableton, how you can drag and save entire groups. So like if I have an entire group from a previous project file, I can just drag yeah. that group straight into the new one. So like I actually, my templates became more minimized because I can just drag an entire drum rack from a previous track and then just change like one, the kick drum and snare. And yeah. then I've already got all the hi-hats and everything already programmed in from that group. So that's kind of like my templates, basically just that, just dragging in previous shit now. So yeah. even more minimal. Yeah, I feel like the quicker like workflow you have, the better, really. Because when you have an idea, you don't want to be sitting around like doing tedious stuff. You kind of just want to do things quickly rather than be, like searching around for an effect sample or something. Yeah, like, I feel I like the same sweep all the time. Yeah, I feel like when you actually have more time on each project, you actually get better because you have more time to like try new things and like do the thing you didn't have time to do before. Instead of like, you know, just doing the tedious shit and constantly tweaking things that could have already been saved. I think another thing in terms of like a mindset of producer as well is I think something that I've like kind of learned recently is like the, atten the attention to detail is really what separates like an amateur song from like a professional song. And it's like, for example, spending like, I don't know, 20 minutes on a fill or spending like a finding the right vocal or like tweaking tweaking the the drum group or i don't know just the really small things all adds up where it's like the re the transition or the reverb um so like putting all the elements in a space like say if it's like a grungy song like i put like a convolution reverb with like chamber um to make it like kind of like dark rather than like an, a nice like low cut uh small room reverb um so i like to use like the compilation reverb um but those are all things it's like things sitting in the mix properly and um but yeah i think it's just all like at the end of the day it's like a mindset thing it's kind of like with intros it's and so do you have any uh big things coming up that oh one sec my dog is like <laughs> my dog is going crazy in the background can you hear that <laughs> no i can't hear it oh, okay sweet <laughs> Do you have any like big things coming up that you can talk about, like any bigger releases or like shows or anything like that? Um, yeah, I got a song out on this like well, Friday for Australia or well, tomorrow, and then um, where I'm pretty stoked for, and I got like an, uh, a release next month, probably like my most anticipated tune. Um, and I got a few other releases, but. Is that, is that the tune that you showcased like the other day on Instagram, where it was like fucking like 200 people just got nuts? Oh, yeah. It looked like a city I show, so. I think. It's like the, you were like, oh, this is the song I was open my shows with or something. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is that the that one? one? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, that, I'm pretty stoked for that. Yeah. That um, sounds fat. Yeah. That was like a massive breakthrough, like intros when I, like, I wrote that because I spent like a bunch of time on it. And then I got Sick. like a Sydney show. Um, in on september 8th on a boat it's like my first sydney headline so Sick. yeah pretty stoked for that go to stack support lineup um yeah awesome well just to like close out the podcast this has been really like really uh good in terms of like talking about like the technical sides of like the workflow and how you're approaching tracks and i really appreciate you sharing that with me about like you know how you're being more productive in terms of like your efficiency. Cause I think that's something that we try to really um, embody with industry set. Like everything we're trying to do here is all just like optimizing somebody's time and workflow and whatnot. So a lot of people are going to appreciate that kind of uh, value. But yeah, man, thanks for coming through and sharing all that with us. No worries. Thanks for having me. No worries, man.